recording. Welcome everybody to the webinar, Preparing for the New Day, featuring Mayor Mark Funkhauser, my colleague Nick Kittle, and myself, Rebecca Ryan. We're gonna be walking you through three big beats today. Each of us has planned five to 10 minutes of content, but we want most of this to belong to you. So right now, if you open your chat window, um, you can start typing chats to me, to Nick, to Mark. I prefer if you're gonna ask a question, you direct it to me or to the entire group and not send it directly to Nick or Mark because I'm gonna be moderating the Q&A at the end. So in your chat, you can say, uh, hey, this is a question for Nick or hey, this is a question for Mark um, and I'll moderate the chat, the Q&A at the end of our time. So the order, uh, the guest order of appearances, is it's gonna go me, then Mayor Funk, then Nick. So ready, set, start your engines. Just one quick housekeeping. Everyone has been muted as you've come in. We're, we'd like to keep it that way. Uh, we've got over 125 participants. If we all hear each other's dogs barking, kids screaming, and spouses wailing, uh, it could be real cacophony. So kindly keep your uh, audio on mute. Here we go. I'm going to start with a, with a quick screen share. So the brand promise here is three things. How do we calm the chaos of this moment? How do we get really focused on our finances so we get that right? We have a lot of budget analysts and people from budget offices, mayors, electeds on this call. And then how do we ready ourselves for resilience? And Nick's got some terrific content on how to not lose our innovative edge in this critical moment. Um, I'd like to start my piece of this presentation by just reflecting that for all of you who are leaders, the energy that you bring to this moment is gonna make a huge difference. Uh, for those of you who were on the webinar I did yesterday, I don't wanna be redundant, but I think we've got a bunch of new people today. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh, there's a story in one of his books about his work early in his career as a monk being one of the people who would go out and rescue the boat people escaping from Vietnam. And he said that there's a lot of chaos on these boats, as you can imagine, as refugees are crossing difficult waters. He said, but you know, if there was one calm person on the boat, we knew we could probably save the boat. And this is an unprecedented moment, unprecedented. Most of us on this call went through the Great Recession. I know I did with my company. Now you throw a pandemic over the top of that and with so many knowns and unknowns. And uh, we are in unprecedented times. But for all of those, or for all of us who at this moment have the badge of leader or somebody who's influencing, we serve ourselves better and we certainly serve our residents better and our teams better if we can stay calm. And sometimes that means not rushing in. I know it's everyone's um, response. It's most people's response that in times of crisis, you wanna rush in and you wanna help. And I think we can all understand that. But there are also moments where it's okay to slow down. It's okay to take a step back. It's okay to try to make some sense of things. So three thoughts for you today. The first one comes from Charleston's former mayor, Joe Riley. He served for 40 years as Charleston's mayor. I think he is the longest serving mayor of any mayor in the United States, but feel free to chat at me and tell me how wrong I am. I often am. It's probably the 50th time today. Um, and I had the privilege of doing an interview with Mayor Riley during what I believe was his last public appearance with his peers uh, at the South Carolina Municipal League. And this was right after the AME Church in Charleston um, had been shot up and several people from that congregation died and it happened in the evening. And because my interview with Mayor Riley was so close to this happening and it felt like such a defining leadership moment, I asked him um, what happened that night and how he processed that as a leader. And he said that when the call came in from the first responders that there had been a shooting at the AME Baptist Church. He knew that he was probably going to have a long night. And he told us that he walked to his closet 
and it was it was in the summer and he was like I had to make a choice you know do I wear a polo shirt um, which would be much more comfortable or do I wear a suit and this has always stuck with me uh, he said I chose a suit because I knew that uh, the ministers would be there and other people from the church community would be there and I needed to look my best uh, and we might be in this for a long time you know he's like I dressed I chose a suit out of respect for who I was going to help and what the circumstances were. And then he said, uh, something happened immediately. Number one, people in Charleston were heartbroken and he had to give some perspective. And the perspective that he gave was that this person wasn't from our community, that, which was true, was absolutely true, but he shared that with residents of Charleston because he wanted to remind them of their own goodness, of the goodness within that community, right? And that this was an outsider who's done this to us. This is not us acting, turning against ourselves. But he said people also wanted something to do. You know, when your heart is broken, when you are suffering, you want to do something very natural, um, natural human response. And so they set up uh, the, the kind of the memorial fund immediately so that people would have a place to give their resources. This notion of perspective and control, um, you guys know that I was trained as an economist. And so I think a lot in terms of X, Y diagrams for better or for worse. And so I think of perspective on one axis and control on the other axis. And I think about the lower left corner, when people feel like they have very little perspective and very little control, that's when people panic and hoard toilet paper, right? That is when people don't have a sense of how long this is, how big this is, and what, and what they can do about it. So, you know, we get some kind of bananas, uh, you know, behavior. But the opposite quadrant of, high perspective and high control is where you can make calm, wise decisions. So when I talk about the energy that we as leaders bring to this moment, a lot of it has to do with that notion of perspective and control. And I want to give you two tools, two frameworks to think about perspective and control within your own organizations. The first one is this. We are in this moment um, approaching the apex of the pandemic and really not sure about the economic repercussions of the moment that we're living in. And we're, we should be doing this, this thing called sense making, which literally means making sense, <laughs> right? Sense making is, listen, we've been dropped into the middle of a blizzard. We don't have a GPS on our smartphone and uh, we don't have any maps. So what the heck do we do? Well, um, one of the things that I've done is I've stood up a small group of subject matter experts in local government and we meet for 30 minutes, three times a week. And we ask each other, what are you hearing? What are you hearing? And we try to make sense together of what's going on. And I encourage you to do the same thing. You know, what are the, who are the people you're talking to? What are the metrics you're looking at? What are the, um, what's the data? Uh, who are those um, sort of those canaries in the coal mine in your community who can help you make sense of some of the early indicators? There is a time for strategy. And uh, for, for many of us, our emergency strategies are already kicking in. But sense making should come first so that when strategy comes, it's based on a map, not based on a blizzard. The second thing that I think can help us get some perspective and control is by literally walking ourselves and our staffs through three plausible scenarios, three zones of scenarios. On the bottom there, the zone of growing desperation. If more goes wrong, what is that gonna look like, right? So if, we, if our spike isn't up and down, if we end up with a double humped pandemic curve, What's, what could happen, right? If um, more goes wrong at the local government level or if um, you know, suddenly there's some foment, right? What are the things that could plausibly go wrong? And it's important to imagine 
what that future could look like. So right now I've been working with communities and organizations that are looking at the next maybe six months to end of the year, and they're thinking about their future in these three zones so that they can make wise and informed decisions. And we start with the challenging zone because people need to worry. They do, they need to worry, they need to get their fears out. Because if you start in the visionary zone, very often the people who normally think zombie apocalypse, they cannot go there. They can't think of visionary until they get the challenging stuff, the difficult stuff, their deepest fears off their chest. So start in that challenging zone and then ask about the expectable zone. You know, from an economic perspective, we have been through terrible, terrible economic times before. And what's been true? You know, which have been the communities that have bounced back the fastest during the Great Recession? What can we learn from them, right? How does this stimulus package compare with the last stimulus package? And, and what do the smartest people say about the, the tale of this stimulus package? And then finally, the visionary zone, the zone of high aspirations. This is so important for us to think together about the visionary zone. And I wanna close with this thought right now, when we're asking people about what surprising success could look like, many of them are having difficulty doing that. They are saying that back to normal would be surprisingly successful. I admit I am a Pollyanna, but if we simply go back to normal and feel that that is the visionary future for our communities, I really think we've missed, we've missed an opportunity to really restructure some things. So how can you help your teams, your staff lift their eyes and think about what surprising success really could look like? So perspective and control will help you calm the chaos. And here are two tools, sense making and the three future zones that can help you bring some structure to those conversations. It's now my pleasure to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to my colleague, Mayor Funk. Mark, take it away. All right. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here today with you and Nick uh, talking to this group about uh, how we can deal with this really unprecedented uh, crisis, a, a global pandemic and a uh, huge economic recession. So first, from a financial point of view, I want to talk about the basics. This is stuff that People probably, certainly in the finance world, already know, but a refresher is okay. And, and for leaders who aren't finance professionals, it's really probably pretty useful. The first is this, that cash is king. Slow the flow. So what you have to do right now is make sure that you've identified every pocket of cash in the organization, all the special funds that you have and so on, you need to take a look at and make sure that you know where the money is because you're going to need every dime uh, going down the road. The good news is that a lot of cities over the last uh, several years since the Great Recession um, took a lesson from that and they have been building up their reserve funds quite a bit uh, and that's a really good thing. The key now, though, is to think about the reserve fund as a bridge. A lot of people make the mistake of avoiding, when things go wrong, they avoid a decision and they use the reserve fund as sort of a, a means to keep paying stuff out of the reserve fund uh, so that they don't have to decide to make some painful choices. It's turning a city or a state or a county is like turning a big ship. It takes time from the time you make a decision till there's an impact. And the reserve fund allows you to pay the bills and keep things on an even keel while you're waiting uh, for the decisions that you've made to have an impact.
The next thing you want is targeted cuts, not blind austerity. So you're going to hear people say things like, well, in the name of shared sacrifice, everybody in the organization should take a hit. That's a mistake. That's not the right lens. The lens is what does the community need and what does the organization need to be able to meet the, com the community need. It's not a time to make sort of blind, across the board kind of cuts. It's a time to be very, very deliberate, to use that slow down control and perspective stuff that Rebecca was talking about, to be able to be smart about how we do this. The next thing is, this is like a normal disaster. It's not normal, these are her surreal times, but document your costs. You're using your healthcare workers, if you're a county hospital, over time, a lot more. You're buying equipment that you never bought before. Your first responders are doing things that they never did before. They're charging overtime. Document all that. Document all your costs, because you're going to need that down the road. Uh, and, and that brings me to the next thing, grants management. So there is money coming, some of it from the feds, some of it perhaps from the states, some of it from uh, philanthropy. But you have to be able to get it and find it. And sometimes it's complicated. So you make sure that your grants management team has everything they need. Check in with them. Make sure they're on top of things. This is not the time to uh, make a mistake or to ignore something that you were eligible for. So if you're a big organization and you have an existing grants management team and you're the city manager or the deputy city manager or somebody like that, check in with them. What do you need? How are you doing? Uh, are any of your members sick and at home? Can you do the grants management stuff that you need to do uh, remotely by teleworking? All that sort of thing. And if you're a small organization that doesn't have an existing team, then obviously, you need to tap somebody. You need to put together some kind of group because there is money coming and you need to make sure that you get it. So then those are the basics. I wanna step back and take a little bit wider view. And the first thing is, is that everything is connected to everything. You, you see this over and over, but I really learned it when I was in the mayor's office. You pull a string, and all the other strings move. It really is important to recognize that. And so what does that mean in this situation? It means that every operational decision that you make has a financial impact. And every financial decision that you make has an operational impact. And you want to know that. You want to be intentional about that. So you want to have your finance people integrated with your emergency operation people. They should be working hand in glove together so that they each can think about what the other says. When operational decision, you know, the finance people say, well, if you do that, this is gonna happen financially. Is that something we want? When the finance people say, we've got to do something different here. We're gonna, we're gonna save some money by doing this. We're gonna spend more money in this area. What is the impact on operations? Those things need to be integrated. GFOA, the Government Finance Officers Association, uh, recently put out a book called Financial Foundations for Thriving Communities. And the brilliant idea in this book is to take the research of a woman named Eleanor Ostrom. She was the only woman to ever win the Nobel Prize in Economics. And what she did was show the design principles that allow organizations, people, groups of people, if they're managing things like water or fishing rights or, or uh, communal land, how to avoid what's called the tragedy of the commons. And this, of course, applies to finance. You know, it, that is the brilliant idea here, is to take you know, the, the tax and fees and revenue of a community and understand that it has to be managed as a common pool resource, just like you would if it were a common uh, pasture. A principle, you know, she has several design principles, but the ones that really apply here in my mind are these. 
clear rules. So people need to know what's acceptable and what's not. There needs to be monitoring. You know, we need to watch people and there need to be sanctions and incentives for things that work, uh, sanctions and rewards. Uh, if people see other people shirking, it really uh, demoralizes them. And of course, it incents them to shirk. Why should I, you know, why should I work at this? Uh, why should I keep my six feet of distance when nobody else is? Why should I stay home when nobody else is? All that sort of stuff. So the leadership has to be very clear about what the rules are, and they have to be very clear about enforcing the rules so that other people can see that they're being treated fairly. And this is another really important principle, I think. Key investments have to be maintained. You will surely have to cut staff. I mean, when you think about it in local government and in state government, but especially in local government, most of our costs are labor costs. In the, in the uh, Great Recession, uh, cities laid off hundreds of thousands of staff, and this could probably be worse. But make sure that you take good care of the people you're able to keep. You have to convince, continue to invest in their training. They need to be cross-trained. They need to have the right tools, and they need to have the appreciation. Uh, you want to make, if you can, one deep cut early. That has the greatest financial impact, and it, uh, it allows you to avoid the sort of drip, 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 where people are wondering, am I going to be cut next week? Am I going to be cut next week? And it, that really saps morale. And then you also, of course, have to continue to invest in cre uh, critical uh, physical capital. You can't allow important equipment to break down because it wasn't maintained. You can't allow uh, important pieces of infrastructure, water mains and so forth, to break down because they weren't adequately maintained. So you have to, you're, you're, you're pulling back, you're going to cut costs, you know, revenues are probably going to plummet, particularly if you're an income and a sales tax jurisdiction, uh, but you have to be very careful and smart and deliberate about this. And now sort of stepping way back and looking at the big picture. So the National Research Council uh, does thousands of citizen surveys. Uh, and over the last uh, 15 years, these community surveys, when they asked residents to prioritize what they wanted from their local government, it was safety and the local economy, number one and number two, over and over, safety and the local economy. Well, look at this. This dual disaster hits both of those. So it's hitting both the things that your residents care the very most about. This is um, a big deal. And so what you need to do is you need to recognize it's their community and their money. And while you're having regular briefings on what you're doing about COVID, you also have to tell them what you're doing about the government, what cuts you're making, what cuts you're not making, what changes you're making, why you're making those changes. You need to talk to them about what's going on in the community with regard to the virus and, and the business closures and all that sort of thing. But you also need to talk to them about how you're spending their taxes and fees. You need to do that as regularly as you do uh, talking about the, the public health things. And of course, they are completely related. We would not have the recession if we didn't have the pandemic and the stuff that we have to do for the pandemic. You have to give residents a seat at the table, you know, and they need to understand that you're giving them more, not less transparency. You have to move quickly, but you don't want to move so quickly that you don't take the time to tell people what you're doing. And then finally, there's this. You want the overall framework that you want to provide to the residents of your community is a barn raising, not a vending machine. The government is not something that they go and they put money in and they get stuff out. The government is you and them working together. Public services, all of them, are produced by residents and government employees working together. They're co-produced. Everything that we do, from public safety 
to uh, you know emergency response. If you look at a disaster, the first responders uh, in a tornado or something like that are almost always ordinary citizens. So you need to be able to do both, and you need to create a spirit of we're all in this together. Everything that you do and say to the community needs to be we're all in this together, and that should be easy in this case because it's absolutely true. Uh, that's my share of, of this, and I'll turn it over now to Nick. So thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Hi, everybody. Um, continuing the conversation about this, really excited to have the conversation, although it's a difficult one to have. I think that Rebecca and Mark set the stage excellent. And again, we want to talk about this concept of resilience. Um, you know, for my space, I usually help governments understand what it means to innovate. And in that space of innovation, usually what I'm helping them understand is how urgent and that urgency is such an important part of laying out an innovation framework. And I think we actually have something of an opposite situation going on here, which is, um, as Rebecca sort of hinted at, it's about calming the chaos, not about defining the sense of urgency anymore because people feel it. Um, so in a little bit of a departure, I wanna take some very tactical steps here um, that you can do to help enforce and reinforce innovative behaviors in your workforce because the way we've always done it is getting gut checked at the door right now. And if you're looking for an opportunity to innovate, this is your opportunity in your community. The question is, um, you know, what interconnectedness is at play here? So first of all, let's redefine risk for a second. Um, does the way we've always done it work? If it doesn't, you're finding out right now. Uh, so, you know, we're putting things through the test and through their paces. And if we're not ready for it, you're going to discover at this exact moment what's not working for you. So. Um, it, it really is the time for innovation to happen now. The way we've always done it, this is the moment where we can change all of that and we have a very important reason to do it. Um, part of doing that is making sure that we prepare people for the mental changes that are about to occur. So make sure that you, you know, as both Mark and Rebecca said, it's about laying out that worst case scenario and having those discussions about what happens in a negative situation so that we know what that looks like and we can start talking about how we can do better than the worst case. How can we create a best case scenario? But it starts with having that very real discussion of what does radical change look like in this organization as a result of what it is we're experiencing? So as Mark indicated, the financial perspective, what's that radical change look like that we need to engage in? Um, and, and how are we going to get there? So here's a one, two, three to get started with innovation in your efforts. Um, Let's give employee guidelines about innovation. What is it that's acceptable and not acceptable? Mark indicated that, um, and I think that's it. What is it we want our employees to be doing right now? In innovation fund, while we may be looking at sort of these austere moments where funding might be an issue for us, it actually is incredibly critical at this exact juncture in time for us to have the ability to spin up and test employee ideas so that we can head off the next crisis that's going to come. You know, we talk about these ripples that might happen. Um, and there's a lot of ripples out there. Can we get ahead of the curve? I believe we can in many cases. Um, and so it's about having an innovation fund and the ability to fund employee ideas. It does not need to be large. And then how do we do rapid fire pilot programs? So let's walk through those real quick. Um, first of all, innovation guidelines should be laid out for your employees. Um, I advocate for this in a normal work environment, but in this extreme time, it's especially important. Our employees in the field need to make difficult decisions. The question becomes, are they equipped and do they know what's okay and what's not okay? You know, have we empowered our employees to make those decisions in the field? So for example, these are some that I would recommend that you consider. Um, again, your community is unique, so decide for yourself what works for you. But the questions I would usually encourage people to ask is, does this solve an important problem and are we the right ones to solve it? Uh, we may not have masks in the hospital, but is that the role of government to solve that problem? Maybe not but it is important. Um, so if we're not both the right person to solve it and it's an important problem, maybe it's not the right time for us to be working on that problem in particular. Does this protect the safety of our residents and our employees? And now, especially in this time, incredibly important. And does this adhere to our organizational values? Uh, you know, last year I had the chance to visit with 50 different communities and it's amazing the level of buy-in that people have to their organizational values. It is a really good time for us to, if you haven't, 
dust those off and reinforce those because if employees are making decisions that relate to our organizational values, they should be safe from retribution of any sort. Um, so it's really just some guidelines that they can use to go ahead and be better. Let's talk about an innovation fund and an innovation form and how we do that real quick. The advantage of an innovation fund is that we can mitigate organizational risk because now we are working together to try new ideas and it minimizes individual employee risk. It's no longer my idea, but it's the collective works of our entire team that are being put to a risk profile. So now it's not me being 0 for 1, it's our team being 5 for 6. That is a very different concept and now we've found a way to manage and mitigate organizational risk as well as minimize personal risk. Um, and it also allows us to clarify what success looks like. A lot of folks want to innovate, but they don't know what it is their bosses or their organization value out of that. We can define that through an innovation fund. So it's a really powerful, simple technique for us to mitigate the risk as well as clarify what success looks like. So let's walk through this real quick. One, keep it simple to apply. I've seen some very onerous ones. Look, we all work in government. I don't need another government form to fill out, okay? Um, so you know, let's keep it human. Let's talk, keep it simple, folks, you know, and, and let's make it as easy as possible. One page, front and back. Um, the other advantage here to Mark's point about fiscal responsibility, the fund should not be too large. Let me just expand on that for a second. If it's too large, people will use it as a workaround to the budget process. If it's too small, it says we're not serious about innovation. So the goal is to find something that is large enough that says we're serious, but small enough that people won't use it as a workaround. So again, it's just designed to spin up pilot projects, not fund ongoing expenses. We try an idea through the fund. If it works, we find ways to fund it, expand it, or not. You as a community can decide the criteria. It can be unique to you. And that's important with the different communities I've talked with, everybody's at a different phase in the situation. Um, and, and it allows for that financial oversight and that data tracking uh, that Rebecca and Mark both talked about as being so critical for us making informed decisions as leaders going forward. And that's what it's about. So we need to track that. Um, we can have a selection committee that helps to go ahead and parse that out. So again, like a grants team, if you don't have one, which I completely agree with Mark on this, get your grants team ready. If you don't have a selection committee, get the selection committee. It doesn't need to be large, um, but you do need to have a group ready to go. And the focus is on taking action, getting an idea off the ground. Here's what the form looks like itself. I don't wanna to spend too much time on this, but I do wanna just give you a brief overview. Some basic information, a title, project summary, as well as an impact statement. Who is going to be impacted by this? And the proposal cost, how much will this cost? Best guess estimates. Right? We don't have a crystal ball, so we have to kind of give that out. Then we talk about what other resources do we need in this? Um, what's the timeline to get the project completed? What risks do we know that are out there? That interconnectivity, right? Are, are we playing, which side of Rebecca Spectrum are we playing on? The visionary side? Are we talking about uh, mitigating future disasters? So talk about that potential risk and the criteria for scoring. So you'll see in this specific example, uh, the criteria here, is it original? Is it impactful? Is the idea practical? Is it measurable, is it reproducible, and is it sustainable? If it's got those six elements for this form, that is a great innovation. But again, you decide the criteria. I also recognize that most of our employees are at home in many cases. So let's make this electronic. I took that form that you just saw, turned it into a survey monkey. If you fire up the camera on your smartphone right now, scan the gigantic QR code that's on your screen, chances are it's gonna take you right to the survey if not, copy the link on the left-hand side over there, and it is a free example for you to be able to use to start the fund. So if you want it, I don't want you reinventing the wheel, let's not waste time. Start with this as a template for yourself. And Rebecca got it, so hopefully you're getting that as well. And we can make sure if anybody didn't get that to get you a copy. Uh, but again, just wanted you to have a very practical tool walking out the door to be able to help get this going because now is the time for innovation. And let's talk about these pilot projects for a second. Okay, it's about putting action into ideas. I have over 65 pilot projects during my government career, and the point was to do. The 90% of our time should be spent doing. It just tends to be that we're so bad at being creative, we have to spend a lot more time being creative to get there. But really, we want 10% of our time being creative and 90% of our time doing pilot projects are where we get the rubber meeting the road on that and what that looks like. So here's how we do that real quick. We're gonna ask some very extreme questions to prepare ourselves. One version of this would be, what if this service or idea that I had only had to provide service for one person? That's probably how you want the service or project to feel. 
Now what if I had to provide that service to 100,000 people? Now I've created a framework where the extremes help to guide what might occur with that pilot project itself. Then we figure out how small can we make this to test the idea out and how quick can we do it? Ordinarily, I'd say we're looking at you know, one week, uh, even a couple weeks. In this case, we're literally talking days. How quick can you iterate? How small can you make it? Because the other part is we have to scale very quickly. Um, because we do have to go from providing that to 100,000 residents overnight. So we have to look at how are we gonna scale this idea quickly? We measure one to three things very well. That's what we're after. Don't get crazy with it. One to three things very well. And then just like the instructions on the back of your shampoo pot bottle, lather, rinse, and repeat, right? Iterate, improve, scale up, pilot, and try that idea out again. This helps to build that culture of doing. It's great when there's no crisis. Right now with something as an impetus for change, we have the ability to make that change. And just a quick guide to dealing with failure, um, because some of us are gonna have that fear factor associated with this. There's two types of failure I want you to wrestle with. One is failure of the heart, the other is failure of the head. Failure of the head is almost always okay. You made a strategic error, you didn't dot an I or cross a T, you had a good concept, it didn't work. Failure of the heart is embezzlement, amoral activity, never okay. Failure of the head, okay. Um, culture of trying is an innovative culture. So when we get into this pilot culture, that creates a culture of doing, that really starts to transform that expectation for your employees and you as leaders, right? And then again, your reaction as a leader to an unexpected result will drive your employees' behaviors going forward. If you freak out because something didn't work like they wanted it to, chances are they're not going to be the ones to step up and rise again. So just be mindful of this as you deal with failure. Your reactions will drive a lot of the behaviors. So again, getting started now, give the employees some guidelines. What is it you want them to do? Implement an innovation fund. It does not need to be large, but right now is the moment to actually make that meaningful change. And again, increase the speed and the expectation related to rapid fire pilot projects. By doing those three things, hopefully you can get the innovation going, get your employees excited, uh, and get them pumped. Um, what I wanna say about this real quick before we hand it back to you all um, is, you know, trust is low in government. It is the number one fear in America, according to Chapman University, uh, their study on American fears, five years in a row, corruption of government is the number one fear in America, which means the bar in some cases is set very low. We can crush that bar right now. This is a once in a generation, once in a lifetime, once in a hundred years opportunity for us to restore and build trust across the country. The communities that find ways to do this right now are going to be the ones that have success for generations to come. It is a defining pivotal moment for us. And so I hope we can all rise to the challenge together. So I'll leave it there and just say on behalf of all three of us, thanks for what it is you do for the communities you serve. Um, really appreciate it and love to hear your questions or thoughts. Awesome, Nick, thank you so much. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping announcements. Um, one is that some people have asked, "Will can we get the slides? Yes, you absolutely can, but we must get your email address. As you know, we did not require registration for this. This was free and open to anybody. So just throw your email in the chat. I'll scrape the chat and we'll make sure that you get everybody's slides. Um, I think quite a few of us grabbed the QR code as well. So, and ooh, the chat is like lighting up. Nick. Two questions have come in for you, but I have just um, invited people to add their questions as well. The first one is this, what are some examples or case studies of local government that are using an innovation fund guidelines and rapid fire pilots? Sure, um, I think, you know, one I'd say that I think City of Fort Collins does, I think an excellent job with their, um, their rapid pilot program. They've got a real culture of doing and a real culture of innovation there. Uh, there are, you know, there are honestly dozens of examples of innovation funds. What I find is it depends on your community type, the way that it's structured. So some communities being much larger, they have a much more uh, administrative process with that, whereas smaller mm -hmm. communities that I've worked with, uh, you know, they're able to have a smaller fund, less oversight, much more rapid fire. So I think part of it's the structure and size of your organization. For anybody who's got that question, I'd be happy to visit with you about specific examples of communities like yours, because uh, I'd hate to refer you to to an Austin, which might not be a relevant example for, for a smaller community like, like Mustang, Oklahoma. Um, you know, that might not be the most comparable example. So, uh, but there are, are countless examples across the country. I think it's mostly just about finding one that mirrors and matches up what it is you do. 
Here's another question for Nick along the lines of an innovation fund. The question is, can you use an innovation fund to contribute to resident or business projects that advance health, economic recovery, and resiliency? Absolutely. You know, I, I see, and again, this is based to Mark's point on the funding mechanisms that you have. We have a lot of weird funding mechanisms in government. And actually, I saw one very recently, and I, and I hope they wouldn't mind, but Springfield Township in Ohio actually contacted me. They're using their funds to, uh, to help buy in on some concepts related to, they have a very specialized, dedicated fund for this, um, but to actually buy gift cards from small businesses in their local, uh, in their local business, they're buying the gift cards now at full price, offering them to residents at half price. Because the fund itself has very specialized purposes, they're able to do that. So they're helping to shore up local businesses and at the same time offering a benefit to residents with a funding source that they, in all honesty, are hamstrung by. So again, it's, they found out the special rules, they applied the funds in a new way, and now they're actually supporting small businesses as well as their, uh, as well as their citizens by using those funds for that. So I, I've seen examples of that for sure. Um, Nick, I have a question for you. So, yeah. you know, a lot of people are talking about this is a moment where there can be a lot of opportunism, right? So there are people who are doing all kinds of shenanigans. Um, how would you recommend that folks, you know, use this process in a way that, um, you know, we all know that person who's like going to now use this to like get their pet thing done. Um, what, what do you, what do you recommend? What do you have to, what do you think? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, everybody's got the greatest idea in the world and I appreciate that. So, uh, but you know, when it comes to those, the folks who's got their pet projects, that's the point of the criteria and the selection committee, right? Um, so if we've got clear criteria, we can set the criteria. And, and honestly, if their pet project meets the criteria, then why wouldn't we consider it? But if it's a pet project, you're trying to run through this. The point is, is that it's not recurring expenses. It's not FTEs. It's a pilot project. We can try your idea, but you will still have to go through a funding appropriation process to get your pet project off the ground. So we're not going to fund your hot software idea, but we'll let you try it on a very small scale with a small group of people. You tell us what the results look like, and then we'll make a bigger determination on, the, on whether that works. So as long as we've got criteria, we can flush that stuff out, Rebecca, in my opinion. Even if it's the person who always takes the last of the coffee and never makes fresh? Can, can we just talk about that person for a second here? Oh my God, I think That's we a monster. do. God, right. exactly. Monster. Um, I do have a question from Mayor Funk here. This is a layoff question. Mark, you said something about do it early, do it deep, and I, I believe it was in an effort to conserve cash. Um, one of our participants says, when you're thinking about layoffs, who's often the most likely to be laid off or how should we be thinking about this? A lot of people are sent home as non-essential staff. They're feeling like hot air balloons just floating off in space. Sometimes their managers who are essential staff aren't even talking to them. And as you can imagine, that becomes a little anxious for folks. So give us your best layoff advice. Well, so the, again, there are two lenses that you want to look at this through. The first is, what does the community need? You know, and if the community doesn't need what you do right now, then maybe a furlough where you're not laid off, but you're sent home for a while without pay makes sense. Um, but then what does your organization need? And so, for example, I have seen where organizations are keeping public safety and so on, but letting go finance people. Well, I wouldn't do that because you're going to need them to manage the money. Now, uh, and you're certainly going to need them when it comes time to get the money that's available from somebody else. So, you know, you want to do this in a way that doesn't damage the organization or it doesn't damage it critically. This is, you know, one of the points that we're making in this webinar that, that uh, Nick is, is talking about a lot is resilience. So being able to bounce back. And if you take care of the money correctly and you take care of your people correctly, you'll be positioned to bounce back when this ends, whenever that might be. So Mark, here's a question. Um, how do you, well, there are two questions that have come in for you. One is, we'll start with this one. What are the pluses and minuses of a formal declaration of fiscal emergency? Well, to me, I don't see too many minuses. 
to me, that's a good thing to say, look, we recognize that this is a formal emergency. Now, whether that doesn't carry the same sorts of public health sorts of things and triggers that um, you know a public health emergency does, but I think letting folks know that, yes, we recognize that we're in trouble. You're in trouble. Your business is in trouble. Your government is in trouble also. We're in the same boat. We're going to try and help each other here. So there, There's a tag-on question, question to that. Mark, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm done. Okay. The tag-on question is, can you anticipate the impact on bond rating? Um, probably it's not, it's not going to be good, but I will tell you that Kansas City, where I was mayor and city auditor for many years, uh, has had a double A rating since forever, since 1948 or something like that. And we went through the Great Recession and we got a negative outlook on our bond rating for a while, but we were able to even get that uh, moved back to stable. So we, and we laid off employees. We did all the stuff that you have to do. Uh, I had the great good pleasure of being the mayor during the recession. I was there 2007, 2011. Um, and it did not damage our bond rating. We, we kept double A, they have double A today. Okay, here's, here are a couple more questions. Mark, you're lighting up the scoreboard right now. Nick, you better get your people like snapped into shape here because you have fallen behind in the Q&A scoreboard. Mark is seriously slamming right now. I think that speaks to uh, wh where people's heads are. So question for you in regards to finance. Mayor Funk said to account for every single dollar because you will need every dime. But here's the thing. Every city department may feel that they are mission critical. So is there a systematic way to fairly distribute funds or do you just do it at the discretion of the mayor? You know, this is, this is the place where that GFOA stuff about common pool resources makes a lot of sense. You don't want to unilaterally, you don't want the mayor or, or the, the CFO or the city manager or somebody to unilaterally decide what we're going to do. You want to take a look at this and, you know, one of the analogies that they use in their book is, you know, if, if, if the goalkeeper, if everybody is shooting soccer balls at the goalkeeper as hard as they can, he's not going to be able to block them all. You need, this is a team effort. It's not up to the finance folks to stop every proposal. So, again, trying to get people to look at it as a barn raising. We've got a problem. We're all involved together. Let's work this out. Let's see what makes the most sense. Mark, another one for you. Okay, and now I come on, Nick's people. I know you're going to get his slides. You think all the answers are in there, but we have his brain right now. What questions about innovation or pilot products do you have for, for Mr. Kittle? So here's another one for you, Mark, while people are warming up their fingers for Nick. In Oklahoma, our sole source of revenue for general fund and capital is sales tax. They get no property tax. Any advice for us other than, of course, a Zoom hug? Um. Well, the Brookings uh, just put out a paper about two days ago with Mike Pagano and Kristen McFarland, uh, who are two of the most well-respected people uh, in the business. And they looked at city by city from, I don't know, 100 cities, what the impact uh, of this uh, recession would be uh, given their financial structure. And for a city like uh, yours in Oklahoma, it's immediate. You're gonna feel the impact immediately. Kansas City, our, our revenue sources are primarily uh, income and uh, sales, not mostly property tax. In the last recession, uh, cities that were mostly property tax, um, had uh, they flattened the curve, to use the pandemic language. language that, you know, and so it didn't hit them hard. So I, I think all I can offer you is that Zoom hug. I also put the resource in the, in the chat if anybody wants to read about that. Um, so... There's that. Okay. Um, for Nick, your people came through. I'm back in. All right. You're back in. Any recommendations for getting elected officials on board to fund innovation concepts during a time staff is being asked to make budget cuts? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you'd feel like those are counterintuitive to each other. And I'd, I'd offer the exact opposite, which is what if I told you that you could hire right now the most creative employee that you've ever had. And if they didn't produce anything for you, you didn't pay them. That's what you're doing with an innovation fund is crowdsourcing the ideas of your employees. And to Mark's point about preservation of your long-term human capital, 
this signals to your innovators, this signals to your high performers that you're doing that. So my argument would be that we need to face and stop unprecedented things. Um, we have the ability to have a small fund, which is essentially an employee salary, if you will, or less than that, that allows us to be creative. And if the ideas come through and we feel they're worthy of funding, they get funded. If the idea is somebody's pet project and not worthy of being funded or doesn't meet our criteria, we don't fund it. Those dollars don't go out the door. So essentially, you're hiring the most creative employee you will ever have. And if they are not working for you and not producing ideas, you're not paying them. Um, that would be my argument. That was such a good, you're, you're a futurist because you actually answered someone else's question inside of that answer. Um, <laughs> Nick, our innovation fund has been very focused on rolling out teleworking technology like Jabber and WebEx, basically getting the job done stuff. Any examples of innovation challenges for teleworking employees? Well, the cat meme thing that Rebecca talked about earlier. Um, <laughs> you know, and I guess the question is, do you mean, are there challenges that we can lay out to our employees about how they're innovating? Or, or I, so I think there's two reads on that question and I'm not exactly sure which one we mean on that. Um, yeah, I wonder if it's, um, Josh, feel free to come back to us on this. Are you talking about how remote workers can become more innovative or maybe the uh, innovative uh, you know, management of remote workers or the getting that barn raising from those remote workers? Um, here's one for Nick. Uh, okay, we're gonna have to bounce some back to Mark. He's, he's like, now he's not feeling any love. He needs a Zoom hug, y'all. Um, and we are at 1252 Central Time, so we've got eight minutes left. Nick talks on innovation. Sometimes different city departments may have a different mission or purpose, but they have the same problems in other departments. Does it make sense to bring different departments, different department workers together to work on shared problems throughout the entire city. For example, city sanitation and first responder employees working on the same problem. Nick, that was for you. I'm sorry, that was for me? I was yeah, thinking it was. it was for Mark. Okay. Oh, sorry. I, I was like, wow, that is a dramatic pause, sir. Yes, I do that a lot. Uh, try that again for me, Rebecca. I apologize. Yeah. No, no, no. The idea was different departments have many of the same problems, but if they just work department by department, it could be a little bit redundant. So is there any um, advice or precedent for having cross-departmental teams work on innovative problems that could help both departments or multiple departments? You know, certainly when we're in a normal environment, that's exactly how we operate, right? Is the innovation fund, the innovation selection committee, your innovation academy, those are cross-departmental, cross-functional teams that are looking for the gaps, the gray in the organization, the things that fall in the silo spaces. And so that's a really powerful space for those teams to operate. I don't think that changes when we move to a virtual environment or this environment. Um, I think that it's about finding the people who have the intentionality of finding the best way to do business and connecting them as your starting point. Um, so to my mind, it's about finding your high caliber employees and say, look, unprecedented times, I need you to come together. You are my dream team of eight people who are going to vet these ideas, grow these ideas into things that are much more functional, much more strategic. So somebody's gonna submit something to you, you're going to vet the idea, you're gonna come up with questions and help them build a better widget to try their pilot out. So to my mind, very much, it's a great opportunity for us to highlight those people who are our high performers um, and, and put them in a position to cross collaborate even more so right now we've got you know the technology requirement to do that and we have actually literally a physical requirement and let's recognize the distance here is physical distance not social distance and there's a big difference between those two so you know this is an opportunity for them to have a proactive role in supporting the organization moving forward and I think your high performers will love that messaging and that opportunity. Um, and that is true, like no matter what the time great. is, but here's, the, here's what I think is really prescient for this time. People want something that feels hopeful to work on and they want yeah. something that's gonna be a ray of light because the emergency response gets old. Y'all are worn down. Mm -hmm. So for people to think like, oh my God, I could help shape a better recovery or I could help shape a better tomorrow or here we have a really cool opportunity. Don't downplay that sort of, you know, that the, the moral lift that people get, you know, the, the boost of moral support. Um, the clarification on the work from home innovation was, um, how to leverage people from home, how to leverage them in this innovation discussion when they're working from home. I, I think it's totally reasonable for us to leverage people from home by doing what we're doing right now. I mean, we've got, you know, I don't know, 160, 170 people on this. 
you know, we can certainly have these conversations. I think establishing a regular cadence and a regular expectation, and even more so now, the urgency is there. Let's make that cadence more regular. Um, but it needs to involve social aspects as well as it as well as real business discussion. So don't over program the business part, um, but allow that sort of natural interaction that people are truly craving and don't have access to right now. You'll find those groups um, spinning up. So one of the things that I do is, um, and, and you can find this, there's a variety of memes out there, but take the stuff that you're finding on Facebook, find a good meme and ask your group to start with that. Put it out there, make it visual, say, which of these are you? And now you've got something that's interactive there to get people started with. And, and to Rebecca's point, I love this. You have to talk about the hope. You know, what are we fighting for here? And there's a great hope message inside of what it is we're doing too. And Rebecca, I know we're running out of time and I know we've got some questions, but I wanted to ask you a question on behalf of some folks as well. When it comes to this question of, of sense making, what would be one thing that people could do right out of the gate right now to create better sense making for themselves as they go through this? Um, um, I would advise you to stop reading the news and start reading papers, start reading academic papers. So if you're worried about the economy, you need to start reading papers on economic recovery. I mean like data-driven academic papers. Um, I'm spending all my time reading that stuff now. The other thing that I would encourage you to do is start, you can play this game with your staff. Play, the, play, the, play a headline game called the worst headline we could imagine and they'll have no problem uh, telling you what it is. Uh, the city declares uh, um, you know, emergency status, we never recover, we get absorbed by our ugly slash awesome neighbor whom we, we hate uh, you know, in, in five years time. Worst ever, right? Okay, now flip that headline, flip it right on its head. Give me the headline of the opposite of that. Oh my God, you know, city survives, shows resilience, um, is very innovative, you know, residents are back in love with us. Holy snikes, we never had any idea this could possibly happen. Okay, so now you have your headline. What are the things that happen that make that headline come true? Very quick game, but it gets people to flip their thinking from the oh no future. I'm trying to clean up my language. It's my 2020, <laughs> um, it's my 2020 resolution. Uh, so that would be one thing that they could do. Um, what are the key data-driven papers that you follow? Here, okay, I will dump my COVID uh, list, my COVID folder uh, in here. We do need to probably wrap up, you guys. So um, Mark, did Mark drop off? I, Mark, if you are still here, please announce yourself, sir. He's on to the next, Rebecca. He's like done with us. He's like, oh, y'all. Totally. He was like, all right, Nick, with all your questions, I'm out. Um, he's got important things to do. I mean, I don't know why he's hanging out with us. Um, I, Mark's got a couple other questions in here. I'll scrape those and send those out. Maybe when we send you guys the email, that's what, that's what I'll do. I'm not going to put the link in the chat. When we send out the stuff, I'll put it all in one email. Um, we love you guys. You are superheroes. We know that you don't always show the giant S on your chest, but we know that you really are. You know, people have been saying like, Rebecca, you know, you're spending so much time with local governments. And I say, everyone's talking about our medical first responders and they are important. But local governments are working on population health. They're working on the eco economy. They're trying to take care of all the issues that were terrible beforehand. So you guys are the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth responders. So it's our responsibility to help take care of you. So keep on doing good work. Take care of each other.